So um, I will, uh, I think this, uh, like I said, this is a very interdisciplinary panel. Eric and I are the two economists uh, on stage. Um, uh, let me first um, ask one question uh, no, uh, um, uh, to, um, to the panel. Um, so in Professor Arthur's description of the um, technical, technological progress, uh, it's rather mechanical, you know, the algorithm you described that te new technology will, you know, will call for the development of additional new technology, which goes into a loop. And uh, so that, and, and I want to ask a question related to some, uh, a recent book published by two economists, Asimoglu and uh, Johnson, uh, titled uh, Power and Progress, where they raise the question of who is making the decision about the direction of technological innovation, right? The technological innovation in their view is not just one innovation. There are multiple dimensions, directions the innovation can go. Some may be more beneficial to the society overall than others. Some may benefit some at least more, but at the expense of others. So how do, what's your view of thinking about, you know, in the age of AI, do, 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 do you know what, how should society decide upon what is the best direction of AI we should go to? So I will pose this question to Professor Arthur, but I will then invite every uh, speaker here to pitch in. Well, let, let me say a couple of words about that. <clears throat> the version I gave of how technology progresses does sound, uh, I apologize, it sounds a bit mechanical. A produces B and then B might produce C and D, which foster something else. But what I do want to point out, and obviously it's in my book, is that there is absolutely nothing deterministic about technology. We don't know, uh, I can go back six months or more, practically nobody I'm sitting here in Silicon Valley right now. Nobody uh, I talked to knew about large language models and the breakthrough that was going to come with chat, chat GPT. Sometimes you get technological progress and it brings something completely different from what you expected. Sometimes you try to push forward. Uh, 150 years ago, we would have liked to have uh, flight in the air before airplanes were invented. There are many, many possibilities and many trials, and they all failed at least until the early 1900s. So there's nothing de deterministic about technology. There's nothing deterministic about its acceptance. Uh, some technologies are wild successes. I mentioned the transistor. The transistor was sold, I think, um, as, or licensed to uh, Japanese for $100,000 just shortly after it was uh, invented, simply because people didn't see much use for it. Similarly, the laser, the maser and laser, those were regarded as solutions looking for problems. <laughs> so it's much more organic and much more uh, a question of fortuitous luck than uh, the caricature that I gave earlier. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Um, Eric, do you have anything to add? Well, you mentioned the Asimoglu and Robinson book, um, which takes the, takes the view that uh, society and government, who is the agent for society, uh, should have a role in directing innovation. We shouldn't just let innovation take place. Uh, we need to guide it in useful directions. Uh, and I have mixed feelings about this point of view. Uh, Mixed feelings because, uh, as we discussed a little bit yesterday in the AI session, and I'm going to elaborate on this in the concluding remarks here, uh, 
innovation depends on making creative leaps. And it's very difficult mm -hmm. for a government or any other agency to anticipate what sort of cre creative leaps uh, might occur. Uh, on the other hand, there are things that governments can do to induce imaginative people to think in particular directions. So for example, uh, if you want to solve climate change uh, and you want to, for example, encourage technologies that will remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, there, there's a, a, a straightforward um, mm -hmm. policy for that. It's a, it's a negative carbon tax. You, uh, just as you charge people for emitting CO2, you reward people for removing CO2. And that is naturally going to spur innovation in the direction of developing technology for carbon removal. Thank you. Uh, uh, Martin, please. Um, yes, yeah, so when, um, as an accompaniment to the, my book, The Imagination Machine, we also, for fun, created something we call the napkin gallery. So um, people tell stories about inventors, um, you know, writing their latest invention on the back of a table napkin. Mm -hmm. um, well, the truth is they actually do that sometimes. And we collected all of those napkins and created an online art gallery of the first sketches of ideas from businesses that change the world. And I think we can see two things very clearly, which is these sketches are always ugly, counterintuitive. Uh, the eventual uses of these things are never apparent to the Mm -hmm. to the inventors. Mm -hmm. um, later, we may get a sort of a, a, a sort of an artificial story celebrating retrospectively the success, but at the time, they're always counterintuitive. So, so that's the unpredictability of technology. But the, actually I actually had uh, Simon Johnson on my podcast recently to talk about the book. He, he actually talks about two ideas, which is the, the, the process of technological innovation and then what he calls the countervailing forces, which are the forces that determine whether it creates shared prosperity or not. Mm -hmm. And um, things like, um, you know, is the, is the technology monopolized? Does it have chances right. to evolve? Is it, is it well regulated and so on? Um, that's a slower process, but actually I think that's intrinsically unpredictable too. So actually um, right now I think, um, you know, my profession is heavily engaged with, uh, with companies talking about um, the uses of chat GPT. And I think it's quite clear that nobody knows what the eventual uses are. We, we, have, right. we have a technical solution and we're figuring out the first wave of answers, but they probably, they probably won't be the eventual answers. In fact, we have a napkin in the gallery, which is a sketch by the founder, where he experiments with writing something and then having the machine turn it into code. And actually, he doesn't know, is this going to kill the programming profession, or is this just a toy? He has no idea. Um, so speaking of chat GBT, I guess, you know, follow up uh, on this question, I think, uh, as Margu and Robinson, they were they asked us the question: Who is going to be determining the direction of the chat GPT, which obviously will have you know tremendous impact on the broader society? Is it you know Microsoft and Google, or some more you know uh, involving a larger um, part of the society in deciding the direction of chat GPT? Does anyone have thought on that? Andrew? I think you know diversity. I mean, one of the patterns you know, is, that we've learned is that innovation, creativity comes from the strangest of sources, very often bottom up, right? Now, you know, a very Western way of thinking about this is there's a genius like, you know, Einstein or Tesla who actually creates this big idea that changes. But, you know, in Asia, we find that most of the uh, uh, innovations are mass-based in innovation. We can't even identify who did it, right? So it's actually a combination of both. I think AI, who wins in this AI game is going to be very uncertain. You know, the big boys have huge advantages and yet small economies, if they get their action right. Look, Singapore is, you know, clearly looking in this area, of punching way above its weight. How did Finland you know, invent Nokia, right? How did Canada, small country, invent you know, the Blackbird. Small countries have huge advantages with global knowledge. And how they adapt is what Wang Yangmin, the Chinese philosopher said, knowledge and action are one. Sometimes theory cannot guide you everywhere. It's practice all by experimentation that will get you. And that's where AI will come from. Uh, uh, 
Professor Chang, please, you want to say something? Yes. Uh, first, I pick up the early question with the short comments. That's the when uh, you said that it may sound mechanical what uh, Brian was uh, mentioning. I think that's actually what Brian meant behind the technology are human agents. And the human agents in the early article for Brian is about uncertainties with all kinds of uncertainties and the human agent pick one instead of the other, create all kinds of multiple choice. Therefore, there's a lot of unknown uh, directions. So this will probably answer this is a, mm -hmm. uh, in a way. So another short comment about this AI. Yesterday, actually, this uh, uh, very much the main focus, but today this brought up again. So I had one question which I posted, maybe didn't have time to, uh, to, to, to discuss is the following. That's AI, I have no doubt, that's the Silicon Valley, or in Hangzhou, or in Shenzhen, or Beijing, anywhere, or maybe less in Europe, but will progress without any stop. Even people get scared. However, there's one point, like from an ecological point of view, there's one point that one should already con be concerned now, is that AI gives you fast food knowledge that's jumping to the final answer without taking care of human side. That's learning curves. The learning curves are skipped. Imagine that's the, Tomorrow's student, our young kids and the university students, or programmers, whatever, they they push the button and get the fast answer. If this become uh, becomes a habit, then everybody jump to the end point, forgetting forming all the painstaking learning curves, which for generations of generations uh, we accumulate the human knowledge is from the uh, human brain. But now you have such powerful tools, the next phase I, should, I think that we should really worry about this uh, short circuiting learning curves. Then that's very much, that will be, we will face a, a very serious, uh, this is a motivation uh, catastrophe. Yeah, so the, the, we'll have more discussions about the uh, impact of uh, 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 chat gpt and ai on many different sectors of the economy including education sector that professor john is mentioning i saw a professor um levin raising hand do you want to say something please yeah yeah i'm my my comments follow up on on the last speaker and on professor lin tao shen's presentation which is um the concern as to whether the rapid advances in ai and digital technologies are going to increase inequities, and uh, because there, there there will be those who will take advantage of this, and those who will be left behind. How do we guard against increasing inequities uh, with these with these massive uh, increases? Right. So this is, I guess, related to my question. You know, AI uh, is there's there's multiple. There's going to be. You know, profound impacts on society, and uh, there may, may be many directions of that AI revolution can take. And who should we, in, as a society, in deciding which direction to 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 uh, to uh, support, have some kind of you know social impact assessment for for certain new directions of AI development. But the challenge, I guess, from listening from the the, the panelists here, is that innovation is just difficult to predict, which, uh, you know, so I guess I, I want to hear more discussions about the question that uh, uh, Professor Levin posed, you know, there are going to be negative consequences of AI for our society and economies, and what should we do uh, to, to prevent or to minimize uh, the possible negative consequences? Um, Stefan. So what I find fascinating um, with, with um, the new possibilities of of seeing economies at work is to to test really um, if Brian Arthur's view is right um, and um, and to see um, this mess that's going on 
in innovation. And what you, if you observe these, these networks as they re, rewire all the time, rewiring means that the company is, is changing its inputs and uh, changing its outputs. And um, through these rewirings, you, you see how, how and where innovation is happening. So as a function of this rewiring, some of these companies will, will just go up, some of them will vanish. Mm -hmm. An innovation is if, if someone rewires and then, and then uh, percolates markets and, and, and everyone or many um, want to rewire with you to get this new product as an input into your products. So you can really in an atomistic way see where innovation is, is happening. And, and the, the preliminary things that we see is that uh, these rewirings are happening everywhere. There's a, every 10 years, there's a complete turnover of, of the supply chain. And, um, and um, um, it's, it's the co-evolutionary aspect of it that, that um, some of these local rewirings will be tremendously successful and that's what we, at the end, in the end, call an innovation, I think. Any, uh, yeah. uh, Eric, please. Just responding to uh, Simon's question, uh, how do we avoid leaving people behind mm -hmm. uh, as AI takes off? Uh, I think part of the answer is through the educational system. Uh, we have long taken it for granted that a good educational system will, will teach kids to read, to write, to be able to do some arithmetic, but added to, to that trio, I, th I think we've now come to the point where, where computer literacy has to be part of the story as well. So, so uh, kids, of course, uh, take to computers naturally, but they don't use, they don't know how to use their full power. They, they use computers for video games and for, for chatting and the like. Uh, making sure that at an early stage, kids have mastered the elements of, of computer programming, I think uh, may be an urgent uh, requirement. At the, and, and, and will go some way toward allowing uh, all citizens to be able to uh, see how AI can improve their lives. Can Thank I you? just answer yes. this? I think, uh, I think this uh, Professor Simon Levin has touched on the core of the issue between economics and science. Uh, as you know, we are just celebrating the 30th, uh, 300th anniversary of Adam Smith. And he's famous for the wealth of nations but actually he started as a moral philosopher. And the pandemic basically, you know, and also the, the populist uprising taught me that all decisions are moral decisions. There's no such thing as utilitarian because even a Bayesian democratic uh, decision uh, may not come up with the right answer. You know, that we all know already. Now, how do we transfer, you know, empowerment through education as uh, Eric says? The problem is the present uh, education cycle is linear. You, you go for you know, uh, 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 six years of primary school, et cetera, et cetera, right? Today with AI, you know, a, a, a five-year-old kid knows more about the, how to use an iPad than myself. And the, the, the school, the kids in most schools know better than about uh, technology than their teachers. So we're in a situation whereby the, how the platforms empower the, 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 um, the, the, the masses to respond to a new age is very critical. And we cannot do this top down. We have to do this bottom up. And I think that you know, we really need to rethink how we go from, as Brian Arthur says, you know, complexity is both, and technology is both a noun and a verb. It's, it's a state that emerges and how the process of helping that emergence into a well-becoming society, you know, is absolutely critical using technology. Because the technology, as you know, can be either good or bad. 
Um, Simon, you have raised your hand. You have right. Yes, uh, I also want to. I wanted to follow up on on that comment. It's uh, actually the comment I was going to make, but um, I, I I I still think it's worth developing it a little more. You know, I, I certainly agree with what Eric said, but traditionally in the schools, when you teach um, algebra, you teach trigonom trigonometry, geometry, you teach our languages or uh, and whatever our traditional schools. The parents have gone through that training first, and then the children learn the same thing. The parents and the teachers help them. We've got, as Professor Shen said, a, a novel situation where the, the, the younger generations are learning things that the older generations have never learned, can't help them with, um, and, and may not even know how to construct um, the, the uh, educational system to teach these things. I think it's a real challenge for us. I agree that we've got to create access and 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 teach the children, but we have a, a situation where the older generation doesn't know how to do these things. Um, we're gonna we have some unique problems. Um, I see two hands up. Uh, Martin, go first. Um, yeah. So we, we have a project, an interesting project with uh, St. Gallen University in Switzerland on intergenerational leadership and and the idea is the one that Simon just said which is we now have this sort of paradox that the the kids know more than the teachers um, we're dealing with the inertia of the edu education profession and also um, relatedly um, you know end of career CEOs you know late 50s have relatively little stake in radical reform for the future to address sustainability and there are technical ways of looking at that but there's also a very human level which is um, accelerating the, the transition of leadership uh, to, to, uh, to a lower age demographic because globally leadership is, is aging. Um, so we're looking at, um, there seems to be relatively little research in this area, but we're looking at um, the efficacy of different models of, for instance, accelerated transition, uh, co-leadership, co bicameral leadership and so on. But I think substituting, um, if you like, experience for curiosity in the leadership equation and different ways of doing it, maybe another aspect of this problem to think about in all walks of life. Okay, um, Eric. So, so on the question of um, what to do about parents who are trying to help their kids but don't know uh, about computers, don't know about AI, uh, one in one class of institutions that have actually been very successful at educational institutions in, in the US uh, is um, uh, community colleges. Community colleges uh, have helped retrain uh, literally, literally millions of people who, who for one reason or another lost their job. They wanted to retrain as uh, in, in some other field, which would, which would require a year or so of investments. Uh, community colleges can also help adults with, um, with, with the computer world. They're already doing this. Uh, uh, most community colleges will, will teach computer programming and the, uh, and the elements of, uh, of AI. But uh, this, is an, this is an area where, again, uh, government investments mm -hmm. can can make a big difference. The, uh, uh, President Biden uh, recently got an infrastructure bill through with some money for community colleges, but it's it's clear that uh, an even bigger investment uh, may be needed. So we have uh, just a few minutes left. I would like to actually uh, end our panel discussion with a question that's pro posed uh, by Professor Brian Arthur. Um, he asked, um, how will generative AI, chat GPT, play out in the economy? And I would like to ask each, pan each uh, panelist to use one minute to get, make the bold, boldest prediction you would like to make uh, about the, you know, how, uh, uh, how chat GPT will, will play out um, in the next 10, 15 years. So I will start with uh, Professor Arthur. Uh, 
Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So uh, what I see is that the current uh, chat GPT or whatever the other competing firms are doing is that to organize the content, the public content of open world, outside the world. So I see the future of this uh, AI enabling technology will be looking at an individual level, knowing like a personal assistant, knowing your all your about yourself, um, personalized to organize your needs, your wants, your wishes, and your preferences, and your learning curves, such as that to match at an equal level to the, a, a, this is a, how to say this is a GPT type of thing. Then between them, it's like machine language dialogue and with your personal assistant help you to boost your learning curves instead of short circuiting. And this way, you have balanced power in sense, personalized and plus powerful answering, uh, answering how to say, uh, capability from outside the world. Okay. So uh, to summarize, you think ChatGPT will be used to uh, maximize the individual's um, capacity to you know, make their decisions and uh, improve their learnings based on their own individual level characteristics. Yes. Um, Just want to add, I'm publishing a book in a few months about this. Um, Andrew. I think the emergence of ChatGPT will follow a power law. The big guys will win, but you don't know where the dark horses, the black swans will emerge. And I think those small economies who, who, are, who can get their act together by state, market, and community using you know the new technology and big data may come out big winners because that then that today in te to today's technology can be scaled very fast so uh i you know i'm you know i i'm i always worry that you know uh, ai tech, uh, uh, revolution will end up creating the world's largest monopolies monopoly right some company with all the skills of it, uh, skills economy because the, the, the AI is, has, enjoys big scale economy. So, but you paint a very much more optimistic picture where community, uh, nation, market, different ma parts of the, of, the, of the ecosystem coming together may actually override the economy scale that enjoyed by Microsoft and Google's other That's world. That's right. It's all, AI is all about governance and co-creation. And therefore, whichever unit is able to co-create in the great imagination will be the winners. Thank you. Uh, Martin. Um, I asked uh, Blaise Aguirre Yakos, a senior guy in, the, in Google's AI establishment, um, a, a similar question. And he, uh, he pointed to a picture he has in his study, which is um, it's a series of uh, photographs of uh, arrowheads and they uh, flint arrowheads and the, the way that they evolved over different nations and time periods. And he says that he did this to remind himself that um, Technology is not an instantaneous invention; it evolves, mm -hmm. and also it's not a thing. It's it's a part of a socio-technical system. It's it's you have how people use the technology is part of the technology. Um, so if I apply his idea to ChatGPT, I think you know I'm not sure that we'll be talking about this particular technology in 12 months' time because there are other candidate technologies. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a very good technology, but we actually don't have the social technical systems yet. We're working on the use cases and mm -hmm. how do humans use, uh, use the technologies. I don't think we're going to be talking about, you know, writing essays in, a, uh, in, in, in 12 months time. I think we're going to be talking about applications with um, using proprietary data and much more specialized applications. And then we'll see the limits of, 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 of these technologies. Um, any data set has a limit. And, and for, for instance, in the realm of the imagination, we're often looking for what the data doesn't say. There are some things that are not all in the data. You know, counterfactual thinking is by definition what, uh, you know, what isn't in the data. So I, I don't think we know, but I think it's more about the socio-technical systems, the way that we use it, rather than the thing itself. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Stefan? So my first reaction to ChatGPT was, uh, it's, it's just about texts. And um, it, it's maybe more... Um, um, a signature of how how simple of, 
of how monotonic and how structured and uncreative our texts really are, <laughs> um, rather than that the machine is so fantastic. The, the, the code, the basic code is just, it fits on a page, basically. But what then struck me much harder is that my students are using it for programming. And if you think that, that this might speed up and, and increase the quality of computer code by a factor 10 or 100, this is going to be a completely different game. This speed and quality, if this, if this um, scales up too quickly, will change the game. And, and who knows who the winners of this, this game is going to be. And, and if you can use it for programming, why not for management or uh, running companies or anticipating things are. So um, um, I have big respect for the, for the wall of uh, increase of speed and quality. Yeah, so it's interesting that when uh, students started to use uh, ChatGPT to a uh, program for their homework and so on, it also tells their professors that the ChatGPT could be a better IA than the students themselves. So some professors are already saying that they get better quality of programming than from ChatGPT than from their RAs. So double-edged sword. Here, uh, Eric, please. Well, so far, uh, the, the chatbots like ChatGPT, uh, as you were saying, Stefan, are, are limited to uh, text as, as input, but uh, there's no reason for it to stop there. And in, in fact, uh, uh, I'm sure that people are already working on the incorporation of, of visual data uh, into, into such systems, which will, which will make them much more powerful. Uh, we, we learn from so much more than just language. We, we, we also learn from our sensory inputs. And to the extent that ChatGPT can do that, uh, it will be uh, even more helpful. Thank you. Then we will go to uh, Professor Simon Levin, and then we'll conclude the panel discussion with Professor Brian Arthur. They are both in very late hours in the US. So uh, uh, Professor Brian's, Levin, please. Yeah, Brian's on the West Coast, so it's not too late for him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> for for me, it, uh, I'm finally yes. on the same on the same day as all the people who are there in person. Well, I I, um, um, I, I, I think the new technologies. I'm just going to reiterate basically what I've said before. Um, are, are like inter, well, they're like introduced species into new environments where there's no natural restraints, and therefore we're in phases of exponential growth. And that's going to mean that uh, they're going to be, as Professor Shen said, winners and losers. Uh, and um, I, I, my concern is that that's going to um, create destabilizing features, just like algorithmic trading in the, in, in, in the financial markets. And so we have to get out ahead of it and think about ways that, um, um, that the explosive new technologies, with all of it, the power that they have, um, don't uh, create uh, um, huge problems in our societies. Thank you. Um, thank you for staying so late. But, uh, uh, Professor Arthur. Yeah. <clears throat> I think there's a bias when we look at things like uh, chat GPT that we, at least I've seen this in the press, that we assume that all industries and structures in the economy will go on much as before but that chat GPT will improve this or speed that up or maybe even replace some of these things. What I'd like to point out is that chat GPT or generative AI will be absorbed into different parts of the economy to produce very different things. So when we actually got computation and data collection in the early 1970s in um, commodities markets, there was an enormously new structure created, the derivatives trading industry. 
simply because we had that technology of we have the data, we have the trading uh, data, we have Black Scholes formula, so now we can set up a completely new industry. I forecast that there are probably be dozens of smaller industries that and smaller structures, including in education, made a fresh and novelly uh, that we ha <clears throat> that we currently haven't even thought of. And Chat GPT or its descendants will be in uh, in the center or the core of uh, many of these new structures. And uh, we won't even have thought of how that might work yet. Uh, thank you so much for all the thoughts uh, and the discussions in this uh, panel. And I think we are coming uh, against our time. Uh, sorry, I, we do have some burning question from. Oh, there's uh, some, we okay. cannot stop it. Okay, yes. So just take one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's actually two questions, but uh, it's simple. Um, a lot of discussions focus more on the macro, uh, macro and micro, um, but we do have talks about uh, somewhere in the middle about businesses. Uh, two questions all related to, to Martin, but uh, Simon mentioned this new paper, which we have to read about the hierarchical responses um, <clears throat> you know, of ecosystem to crisis. And you talk about your observation during COVID of how you know, companies respond or plan about, uh, around it. Um, I believe you read Simon's paper. Uh, how, how many of them were, you know, like you, you find them actually apply to certain companies? Are there, you know, uh, do they make really use of them? How do they, you know, you know apply in the, in the real world? Uh, which of the rules probably doesn't, you know, do not apply? And then uh, you mentioned a, 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 a phenomenon of these five, I mean, seven principles of resilience, where, I mean, you, you did mention CFOs do not like any one of them because, the, uh, the, because of the <laughs> lack of uh, efficiency. And Andrew also mentioned CFO once, and especially you are a counting background, also with you know rich, rich experience in, in policy. And nowadays, with you know all of CSOs are facing mandatory uh, reporting of climate risk, and maybe they will go to quantitative assessment of climate risk of their companies, which for me it's you know it doesn't it's not necessary, and also it's impossible to reach the same. Let's say rigor, I mean, but actually for me, it's not rigor of the traditional whatever assessment. Um, how do we, how do you know, what do you think, uh, uh, Andrew, is, should be our way of working with the CFOs? If I have to say they are probably the most important part of this, of this game, whether for sustainability or for, for AI. Okay, so it's uh, multiple questions there. I will let... Uh... Uh, St Stefan and uh, sorry, uh, Martin and uh, Andrew answer. Um, so, what is the algorithm for a very short response so we can get to lunch? Um, <laughs> well, I, th I think I think we're in the transition in enterprises from a static concept of strategy, which is about scale economies, experience economies, and position, to this more dynamic way of looking at st uh, strategy and. I think we've heard some of the key elements, right? We've got the principles of resilience. So the paper you're referring to that Simon mentioned is this idea of um, progressive commitment. Um, so you have a re first of a re reversible response and then a slightly less reversible response and so on. And um, you also mentioned early warning indicators. One of the reasons why CFOs um, hate, uh, um, may hate, is a, I'm exaggerating of course, but may, may, may not like these forms of inefficiency I called resilience is that and they're not measuring the right things. They're measuring static, backward-looking efficiency over a period of time. Um, so early warning indicators, forward-looking metrics. So for instance, we created a metric called uh, Vitality, which is a predictor of forward-looking growth using, using machine learning. And it's not perfect, of course, but it's, it's actually better than market growth indices. And so we don't have a complete answer to, the, uh, to how to operationalize dynamic strategy yet, but I think in today's uh, speeches, we heard, I think, a lot of the key elements of that new discipline. Yeah, I think very quickly, because the time is short, CFOs are basically in today in today's world's chief data officer. And the data officer or the information or the chief knowledge officer. So he or she must have a, a, a systemic way of looking at not just the static backward looking, but the forward looking issues. And in doing so, he has to convince his CEO and the board why it is necessary to be adaptive and resilient. 
rather than just pure efficiency. Let me just stop there. Thank you. With that, let's give uh, all the panelists uh, a round of applause for, for their wonderful discussions.